Bedtime is supposed to be a happy event for a tired child, but for me, it was terrifying. While some children might complain about being put to bed early before having finished their favorite film or playing with their favorite video game, when I was a child, nighttime was something truly to fear. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who was trained in the science, I cannot prove what happened to me was objectively real, but I can swear to what I experienced was genuine horror. A fear which in my life I am glad to say has never been equaled. I will relate to you, to you all anyway, now the best I can. Make of it as you will, but I'll be glad just to get it off my chest. I can't remember exactly when it started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with my being being moved into a room of my own. I was 8 years old at the time, and until then I had shared a room, quite happily in fact, with my older brother, as is perfectly understandable for a boy who is 5 years old, and my senior brother eventually wished to have a room of his own. As a result, I was given a room at the back of the house. It was small, narrow, yet oddly enough elongated room, large enough for a bed with a couple of chests of drawers. but. Not much else. I, I couldn't really complain because even at that age, I understood what that we did not have a large enough house. I had no real cause to be disappointed. As my family was both loving and caring, it was a happy childhood during the day. A solitary window locked out our back garden, nothing out of the ordinary. But even during the day, the light which crept into the room seemed to be almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given the old bunk bed we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own, I was excited though to be able to sleep in my I was excited enough to be able to sleep in the top bunk, which seemed to be far more adventurous to me at the time. From the very first night, I remember a strange feeling of unease creeping slowly at the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk staring down at my action figures and cards drawn across the green-blue carpet. As the imagery of battles took place between my toys and cars and whatever the hell was on my floor at the time, I couldn't help but feel that my eyes were being slowly drawn towards the bottom bunk as if something was moving in the corner of my eye. Something in which they did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty and impeccably made with a dark blue blanket tucked neatly, partially covering two rather bland white pillows. I don't think, I didn't think of anything at the time, I was a child after all, and the noise slipping from under my door from my parents' television bathed me in a warm sense of safety and well-being. I fell asleep. When you awaken from a deep sleep to something moving or stirring, it can take a few moments for you to truly understand what's happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears, even when lucid. Something was moving, there was no doubt about that. At first I wasn't sure what it was, everything was dark and almost pitch black even, but there was enough light creeping in from the outside to outline the narrowly suffocating room. Two thoughts appeared in my mind, almost simultaneously in fact. The first was my parents were in bed because the rest of the house lay both in darkness and silence. The second thought turned to the noise, a noise which obviously had awoken me. As the cobwebs of sleep withered from my mind, the noise took on a more familiar form. Sometimes the simplest sounds could be the most unnerving, a cold wind whistling through the trees outside, a neighbor's footstep uncomfortably close, or in this case, the sound of the bedsheets rustling in the dark. That was it. Bed sheets rustling in the dark, as if someone, some disturbed sleeper was attempting to get too comfortable in the bottom bunk. I lied there in disbelief. The noise was either my imagination or perhaps my pet cat finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then I noticed my door, shut, as it had been when I fallen asleep. Perhaps my mom had checked in on me and the cat had snuck into the room though. Yes, that must have been it. I turned to the face to the wall and closed my eyes in the vain hope that I could fall back to sleep. As I moved, the rustling noise underneath me ceased. I thought then that I must have disturbed my cat. But quickly, I realized that the visitor in the bottom bunk was much less mundane than my pet trying to find some sleep. 
and much more sinister. As if alerted to and disgruntled by my presence, the disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a temper tantrum in their bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn with increasing veracity. Fear gripped me, not like the subtle sense of unease I had experienced earlier, but now a potent and terrifying one. My heart raced and my eyes panicked and scanned almost the impenetrable darkness. I let out a cry. As most young boys do, I instinctively shouted for my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house, but as it began to breathe a sigh of relief that my parents were coming to save me, the bunk bed suddenly and startled me, started shaking violently as if gripped by an earthquake, scraping against the wall. I could hear the sheets below me thrashing about as if tormented by some horrible malice. I, I, I did not want to jump down to safety because I feared the thing in the bottom bunk would try to reach out and grab me, pulling me into the darkness. So I stayed there, white knuckles clenching my own blanket like a shroud of protection. The wait seemed like an eternity. The door, the door finally and thankfully burst open. I lay bathed in light while the bottom of the bunk resting in place by my unwanted visitor, but it lay empty and peaceful. I cried and my mother consoled me. Tears of fear followed by relief streamed down my face, yet though all the terror and horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset. I could not explain it, but it was, though whatever had been in the bottom bug would return if I even so much spoke of it or uttered a single syllable of its existence. Whether or not this was the truth, I do not know, but as a child I felt that it, I felt as if the unseen menace remained close, listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk, my mother laid in the empty bunk promising me to stay there until the morning. Eventually my anxiety diminished, my tiredness pushed back towards sleep, but I remained relentless, the waking several times momentarily to the sound of rustling bedsheets. I remember the next day wanting to go anywhere, be anywhere, but in that narrow suffocating room. It was a Saturday, and I played outside quite happily, in fact, with my friends. Although our house was not large, we were lucky enough to have a long, slapping garden in the back. We played there often, as much as it was overgrown and we could hide in the bushes. I climbed in a huge sycamore tree, which <gasps> towered above all else, and easily imagine our, and I could easily imagine ourselves in the throes of the grand adventure in some untamed exotic land, so to speak. As, the f as fun as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to the small window, an ordinary sight of in inconvenience. But for me, that thin boundary was looking in the glass window, the strange cold pocket of dread inside of me. Outside the lush green surroundings of our garden, filled with the smiling faces of my friends, but I could not extinguish the creeping feeling that was crawling its way up my spine. Each hair standing on its own, the feeling of something in my room watching me play and waiting for me at night when I would be alone eagerly filled me with hate. It may sound strange to you, but by the time my parents ushered me in the back room for that night, I said nothing. I didn't protest, I didn't even make an excuse why I couldn't sleep there. I simply sullied and walked into the room. I climbed a few steps to the top bunk and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experiences, but even at that age, I felt almost silly talking about anything which I really had no evidence for. I would be lying, however, if I said this was my primary reason. I still felt this thing would be enraged if I did so much as spoke about it.
It's funny how certain words remain hidden from your mind no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word that came to me the second night lying there in the darkness frightened and aware of the change in atmosphere, a thickening of air as if something had displaced it. As I heard the first casual twist of the bedsheets below, the first anxious increase of my heartbeat at the realization that something was once again in the bottom bunk. That word. A word that had been sent to exile filtered up through my consciousness, breaking free of all repression, gasping for air and screaming and etching and carving itself into my mind. Ghost. As the thought came to me, I noticed my unwelcome visitor ceased moving. The bedsheets lay calm and dormant, but they had been replaced by something far more sinister. A slow, rhythmic, rasping breathing heaved and escaped from the thing below. I could imagine its chest rising and falling, each steroid squeezing and groveled breath. I shuddered and hoped beyond all hope the thing would just leave about occurrence. The house lay as if the previous night never happened. In a thick blanket of darkness, silence prevailed all, but for all but for the perverted breath of my as yet unseen bunkmate. I lie there terrified. I, I just I, I just wanted this thing to go and leave me alone. What the hell did it want? Then something unmistakably chilling transpired. It 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 moved. It moved in a different way from before. Before, it, when it thrashed itself around the bottom bunk, it was unrestrained, without purpose, almost animalistic. This moment, however, it was driven by awareness, with purpose, with a goal in mind. For that thing had been lying there in the darkness. That scene seemed to be intent on terrorizing a young boy. Calmly and nonchalantly, it sat up. Its labored breathing had become louder, as now only a mattress and a few flimsy wooden slats separated my body from the ungodly breath below. I lay there, my eyes filled with tears, a fear in which mere words cannot relate to you or anyone else coursed from my veins. I would not believe that this fear could have been heightened, but I was so wrong. I imagined what thing would look like, what this thing would look like, sitting there and listening from below my mattress, hoping to catch the slightest hint that I was awake. Imagination then turned on to a, an unnerving reality. It began to touch the wooden slants which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully, running what I imagined to be its fingers and hands across the surface of the wood. Then with great force it prodded angrily between the two slats into the mattress, even though the prodding, it felt as though as if someone viciously stuck their fingers into my side. I let out a almighty cry and wheezing and shaking and moving the thing and the and the moving thing in the bunk below replied kindly by violently vibrating the bunk as it had done the night before. Small flanks of paint powered through small flanks of paint powered onto my blanket from the wall, and the frame bed starts scraping along against it, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Once again I breathed in light, and there stood my mother, loving and caring as she always had been, with a comforting hug and calming words which eventually subdued my hysteria. Of course she asked what was wrong, but I could not say, I dared not say. I simply said one word over and over and over. Nightmare, 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 nightmare. This pattern of events continued for weeks, if not months. Night after night, I'd be awakened by the sound of rustling sheets. Each time I would scream and not provide this abomination with the prod and feel for me. With each and every cry, the bed would shake more violently, stopping with the arrival of my mother, who would spend the rest of the night in the bottom bunk, seemingly unaware of the sinister force torturing her son nightly. Along with the way, I managed to align illness a few times. I came up with other lines less truthful. 
multiple reasons of sleeping in my parents' bed, but more often than not, I would not be alone for the first few hours of each night in that place. The room where light had been on the outside did not sit right and alone with that thing. With time, you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific or nasty the thing was. I had come to realize that for whatever reason, this thing could not harm me when my mother was present. I am sure the same would have been said for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him up from sleep was almost impossible. After a few months, I had grown accustomed to my nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for some unearthly friendship. I detested that thing. However, I still feared it greatly, as I could almost sense its desires and personality, if you could call it that anyway. One filled with perverted and twisted hatred yet longing for me. Perhaps of all things, it was everything I just mentioned. My greatest fears were realized in this winter. The days grew short and the longer nights merely provided this wretch with more opportunities. It was a difficult time for me and my family. My grandmother was a wonderfully kind and gentle woman. And she had deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. My mother trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. But, however, dementia is a cruel and degenerative illness, robbing a person of their memories one day at a time. Soon she recognized none of us, and it became clear that she would need to be moved from her house into a nursing home. But before she could be moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights, and my mother decided that she would stay with her. As much as I loved my grandfather, as much as I loved my grandmother, and I felt nothing but anguish at her illness, to this day I feel guilty at those first thoughts, but they were not for her but of what my nightly visitor should do if became aware of my mother's absence, her presence being the one thing that was protecting me from the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bedsheets and mattress from the lower bunk, removing all slats and placing an old desk and a chest of drawers and some chairs that we kept in the cupboard where the bottom bunk used to be. I told my father I was making an office, which he found adorable, but I would be damned if I give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. As the darkness approached, I lay there, knowing my mother was not in the house. I knew not what to do. My mind's only impulse was to sneak into her jewelry box and take a small family crucifix, which I had seen there before. While my family was not very religious, at that age I still believed in God and somehow hoped it he would protect me. Although fearful and anxious while gripping the crucifix under my pillow tightly in one hand, sleep eventually came as I drifted off into a dream. I hoped I would awaken that morning without incidents. Unfortunately, that night was the most terrifying of all. I awoke gradually. The room was once again dark, and my eyes adjusted and gradually was able to make out a window and a door, the walls and some toys on a shelf. Even to this day, I shudder as I think of it. For one, there was no noise, no rustling sheets, no movement at all. The room just felt lifeless, yet not empty. The nightly visitor that was unwelcome, wheezing, and hate-filled thing which had terrified me night after night was not in the bottom bunk. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken the very sound from my voice. I lay motionless. I could not scream, but I did not want to let it know I was awake. I had yet seen it, but I could only feel its outline. It was obscured by the very blanket I had over me to keep me warm. I could see its outline, though, and I could feel its very presence. I dared not look, but the weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say hours pass, I do not exaggerate. Lying there motionless in the dark, every bit scared and frightened, and I was every bit of a scared of a frightened young boy could possibly be. If it had been during the summer months, it would have been light by now, but the grass of winter's nights was long and unrelenting, and I knew it would be hours before sunrise. Sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached my breaking point, a moment where I could wait no more, where I couldn't survive under this intimately deviant abomination no longer. Fear can wear you out and make you a threadbare, a shell of nerves leaving only the slightest trace of you behind. 
I had to get out of that bed. Then I remembered that crucifix, and my hands still lie underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I slowly moved it around my wrist to find it, minimizing as best as I could the sound and vibrations that it caused. But it couldn't be found. I had either knocked it off the top bunk or had not even thought about it or just dropped it out of my hand. Without the crucifix, I lost my sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you, you're, you'll be barely aware of what death is and immensely frightened of it. I knew what was going on and I was going to die in that bed if I lay there dormant and passive doing nothing. I had to leave that room behind. But, but how? Should I leap from the bed and hope to make a run for it for the door? Or what if it was faster than me? Or should I slowly slip out of my bunk, hoping that it not deserve my uncanny bedfellow? Realizing it had stirred when I moved, trying to find my crucifix, I began to have the strangest of thoughts. What if I was asleep? It hadn't done so much as breathe since I woke it up. Perhaps it was resting, believing that it had finally gotten me that I was finally in its grasp. Or perhaps it was toying with me. After all, I had been doing just that for countless nights. And now, with it under it, pinned against my mattress, with no matter of ways to protect me, maybe it was holding it off, savoring its victory to the last possible moment like a wild animal savoring its prey. I tried to breathe shallow, as shallowly as possible mustering every ounce of courage I could as I slowly reached over to my right and began to peel the blanket off of me. What I found under the covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but when my hands moved against the blanket, it brushed up against something, something smooth and cold, something that just felt unmistakably like a giant, like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror as I sure it must have known I was awake. Nothing. It did not stir. It felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket, and I felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence almost twisted to some sick sense of curiosity as I moved further down to the disproportionately larger biceps muscle. The arm was overstretched and laying across my chest with a hand resting on my left shoulder, as if it grabbed me in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move the cadaverous appendage if I were even so to hope to attempt its escape. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing over my shoulder might of this nighttime invader had stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach and my chest, and I recoiled my hand in disgust as at the touch of the straggled, oily hair. I could not bring myself to touch its face, although I wonder to this very day what it would have felt like. Dear God, it moved. It moved. It was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears came, but God, I wanted to cry. As its hand and arm slowly coiled around me, my right leg brushed along the cool bed that lay against the wall. Of all that that happened in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching, this rancid thing, drew great delight from violating this young boy's bed. It was not entirely on top of me, but it was sticking out of the wall like a spider striking it. Like a spider striking from its lair. Suddenly, its grip moved from a slow tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed at my clothes as if frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but it, ex it emasculated my arm. It was too strong for me. Its head rose up, right and contracting under the blanket, and now I realized where it was taking me. It was taking me into the wall. I thought for a dear life, and I cried, and suddenly my voice returned to me yelling and screaming, but no one came. Then I realized why I was so eager to suddenly strike. This is why it had to have me now. Through my window, it seemed to represent much malice from the outside and streaked of hope. The first rays of sunshine struggled further and further. I knew that if I could just hold on, it would soon be gone. As I thought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted and slowly started pulling itself up onto my chest and now was poking out from under the blanket, wheezing and coughing and rasping. I do now remember its features. 
I simply remember his breath against my face, a foul and cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon of that dark place, it, the suffocating room a content washed over and was bathed with sunlight. I passed out as its scrawny fingers encircled around my neck and squeezing the very life from me. I awoke, my father offering me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I had survived a night of the most horrible experience of my life until then and now. I moved my bed away from the wall, leaving behind some furniture I had believed would stopped that thing from taking a bed. Well, a little. Did I think it would try to take mine and me? I don't know. Weeks passed without incident, yet on one cold frostbitten night I awoke. The sound of furniture for where my bunk beds used to be were vibrating slowly. In a, mo in a moment passed. I lay, sh I lay there sure I could hear a distant wheezing coming from deep within the wall, then finally fading into the distance. I've never told this story. I never told anyone this story before. To this day, I still break out in a cold sweat at the sound of the sheets rustling in the night, or the wheeze that was brought on by the common cold. And I certainly never sleep with my bed against the wall. Call it superstition if you will, but as I said, you cannot discount uh, the conventional explanations for the sleep paralysis and hallucinations or that of an overactive imagination. But I can say this. The following year, I was given a larger room on the other side of the house. My parents took that strangely suffocating off place as their own bedroom. They said they didn't need a large room, just one big enough and a bed for a few things. <laughs> they only lasted 10 days. We moved on the 11th. <laughs>